Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to uh, today's webinar on making the tough decisions. Uh, if you've just joined us, the poll um, that you see on, on the bottom right of your screen probably is going to be open for just a, a little bit longer. So we invite you to please participate in that. Go ahead and submit your answers um, if you're in progress, and we'll be closing that here in just a moment. Uh, we want to invite you to please participate, um, not only in the poll, but throughout the whole webinar. And one of the easiest ways that you can do that is using our question and answers um, functionality. You're going to see this probably, again, in the bottom right-hand corner of the WebEx screen. Uh, you'll look for Q&A, and uh, then you can ask um, all the panelists a question, and that'll come in to us, and we'll use that to kind of help guide the conversation and address the question. Uh, there may be some questions that we respond back directly to it, or other questions that we'll bring up in today's discussion. So please, I want to encourage you to go ahead and use that um, at, to submit questions to our panelists uh, throughout it. We, this is really a, a community event, and your participation um, is critical to help uh, uh, keep that, that uh, community event going live. Just to kind of set some expectations on what's going to be happening uh, over the next 90 minutes is uh, we're just going to have a, a good community discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about some best practices and ways to deal with um, making tough decisions from uh, our, our panelists. And, and we're going to have your question and answers um, brought in as well. Uh, there is an uh, opportunity for both press and public to view this. Um, if you happen to be a member of the media, we'd love you to just drop a, a note in the question and answers to identify uh, your, yourself. Uh, if if there's anything you want to use from, from the webinar, uh, we just ask you to reach out to us or one of the panelists um, and so that they can help uh, to make sure that, that uh, you get the right information that you may need for your use. And uh, in case this is your very first web webinar with us, um, these are really bi-weekly gatherings of attraction industry experts where we talk about what's going on right now. Um, obviously, uh, there, there's a lot of tough decisions that are being made by attractions across the globe um, at this moment in time, and, and that's really why we're focusing on that. Uh, so you can kind of see uh, through through all those words on the screen what we've we've talked about in the past, um, and we continue to uh, evolve those discussions based on what's happening currently. And if you um, would like more information on our webinars, we invite you to go to gatewayticketing.com slash community. You can kind of keep up with everything that's, gonna, that's going on. You can sign up for some, um, or you can get involved in other ways through some of the um, methods that we have out there. So please uh, visit that if you uh, have not. And I just want to say um, hi, uh, I'm Matthew Hohenstein. I'm one of our principals here at Gateway Ticketing Systems. I, I will focus on our destinations space. Um, and really the, the brains behind all of our great webinars is uh, Mr. Randy Jocelyn. He's uh, another one of the principals. So Randy, welcome. Howdy, everybody. Um, I got to let you guys all know that school is back in session. And what does that mean? That means I've got three of my kids upstairs zooming um, in school. So there's a slight delay when I advance the slides. And should there be any hiccups, my, my buddy Matthew will take over the presentation. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, it's, it's, um, it, we got a great team uh, put together. These, these folks are awesome. We've been having a really good chat. So um, I'm really excited to hear from them and talk a little bit more about making tough decisions, um, moving forward and, and um, you know, keeping guests happy as they, as they revisit uh, your attractions. So um, joining us today is Jonathan Williams. He's the president and CEO of Battleship Iowa in San Pedro, Los Angeles. Hey, Jonathan's waving. He's actually on board the Iowa right now. So um, I, I had to struggle a little bit to find a good shot of him with a the, with the COVID beard in progress. So if you look him look him up on LinkedIn or, or find him on some some media blogs, you're going to see he's got quite a baby face underneath that uh, that beard of his. So um, we're excited to have him join us today. We also have Nick Honeyset, just an awesome uh, person, a, a real friend of the nonprofit community. Has got a great history working at at museums and partnering with museums and coming alongside. He's the CEO of Babylon Park Online Collective. He's also joining us from. 
beautiful California down in uh, San Diego. Actually, this is like an all California panelist uh, program. So uh, Nick's joining us from San Diego and also a great, great friend, Claudette Vogelstein. Claudette is the VP of finance um, at Knott's Berry Farm. Um, she, she's, I think Nick, uh, Claudette, you've been there for five or six years. I'm not exactly 100% sure, but you also used to be in uh, finance roles in uh, the film industry, which is is obviously uh, uh, near and dear to my heart growing up in uh, the shadows of Hollywood and working up in LA a lot. Um, so Knott's is, um, is really lucky to have Claudette on their team and we're gonna share some ideas of how Knott's is kind of um, moving through this the, and navigating the waters. Oh, I, sh I should have said navigating the waters when I was talking to you, Jonathan, but um, um, anyway, we're, we're excited to have everybody. Behind the scenes, Bill D'Angelo is our, uh, our engineer, so to speak, behind the scenes. He's going to fill in a lot of the Q&A. Um, so I can see some questions, kind of people saying hello. As Matthew said, um, we welcome your thoughts and questions. If you have any question at all that uh, you want to ask this team, um, they're going to do their best to, to answer them. Um, we'll try to answer as much as we can typing along as well. Um, so your questions are extremely welcome um, and we will get going. Um, so we always like to start, if you're new to us, with an industry update. Um, you know, there's a lot going on the last couple of weeks, um, a lot of changes, and I, I want to start in New York. Um, you guys probably saw this, and I don't know yet if anyone's joining us from New York, but um, Governor Cuomo announced that museums and cultural inst institutions and attractions could reopen um, you know, actually quite soon. This was a pretty quick announcement. Um, I think it was like less than, you know, a week and a half turnaround. You could see it was August 14th. He basically gave 10 day uh, announcement with some very stringent requirements um, as expected, some occupancy li limits. You know, we've been hearing 25 and 50%, you know, the, the time ticketing, the staggered entry, face coverings and, and control flow. It's something that we're hearing a lot of um, places that are, are have opened for a while. Um, it's interesting that these recommendations seem to come in on day one. But Matthew, you know, you and I were, had talked a lot about it seems pretty quickly those those restrictions get eliminated, I would say. And, and that's kind of been par for the course. Um, it's going to be interesting, you know, how these museums are going to operate with the 25%. Um, capacity limit, and then on top of that, the no-show rates and some of the potentials. Um, so we have some data about reopening that we want to share. So Matthew, um, I'm going to pass it off to you, kind of some poll results from today. Sure. Yeah, so one of the things that um, we've seen over time is that certainly more and more attractions are reopening, which is certainly good um, if, to, to, to take that opportunity to, to try to get back to some sort of normalcy, bring in additional revenue and stuff like that. So um, with with today's poll uh, of our webinar attendees, where we've got now 70% of y'all um, have shared that you're reopened. Um, uh, and there's a, a small amount that they're still um, planning on reopening in the next two to nine weeks, um, but really, uh, uh, you know, Good chunk of, of folks have have reopened. Um, obviously, as we're reopening, we're we're probably having to make some some decisions and evaluate things now with these new conditions. Um, so we're really hoping today's discussion will help to to provide some tools for those that are that are reopened that may be dealing with some of those questions. I was interested to see that some of us it's almost thirteen or fourteen percent actually are not opening for you know up to nine weeks. So that could be. You know, maybe some some folks that had to make the tough decision to not open at all during this summer period, um, which I definitely want to hear from you. If that's if that's your situation, if you're a seasonal attraction, and unfortunately summer 2020 didn't didn't happen for you, um, if you weren't able to open, um, I'm interested to see and hear what is what does it look like as you move into your Q4 planning stage, and and what does next year look like. Um, um, so we're really feeling for you guys that maybe weren't able to open or aren't going to be open for a couple months. Um, you know, this is an article I found and I actually, I, I, it's really, I love technology. And I, what I like about this article is this is a smaller, you know, museum in Canada. It's a, it's a tank museum 
and it's all indoors. And I, I want you guys to watch this video. Uh, there's a YouTube link, and of course, we'll send it to you guys. But what I what I think is interesting is they have this virtual um, assistant. It's virtually, it's Master Corporal Lana. When you walk into the attraction, uh, you walk up to this, this, this corporal, she asks you questions, asks you all the COVID questions that many of us are getting used to. Um, if you're in Tennessee, like I am, you could go to places like get a haircut. I got a pretty significant one uh, la a few days ago, but you have to fill out, you know, a poll and a form, but to even protect you, um, we're starting to see these type, types of visual, virtual tools uh, be readily available even for smaller attractions. Um, it does a temperature screen. Uh, but what I also like about this YouTube video is kind of how they just set up everything with stations. So it's, it was an interesting read there about creating that safe environment. Matthew, you've got some information here about. Yeah. Um, in in uh, one of the things, actually, I, I just was reading through some of the comments on some of the decisions that folks were, were having to make. And and one was uh, about, you know, wearing masks. And and I think that's that's generally been a, a very tough point. Th this article that I ran across from uh, Robert Niles uh, was, was actually pretty pr had an interesting take on it. It helped me to better understand it. Um, you know, they, he had asked several um, uh, folks in, at working at attractions kind of you know what's changed and how, how they're um they're dealing with some things since returning to work and one of the the comments he had gotten was that we've we've been instructed for years on being providers of hospitality now we are mask police and it's hard to be both um and he he actually took one of his experiences um as as being a disney employee and the the just the general focus on safety that they've always had um and and really kind of help to illustrate that this isn't necessarily you know different than what we've done before right we've always focused on ensuring attraction safety and people are you know uh, behaving in a way that that they're not going to injure themselves um this is a little bit you know not the same as a lap bar or making sure that somebody's sitting down on a ride but it is it is the exact same thing of trying to to preserve um, the safe environment. So I found that it just interesting, it kind of a unique way to look at it and maybe a, a unique way to kind of help uh, folks to understand when we're asking them to do these, you know, what they may think are, are new responsibilities that they're really the same. It's just, um, you know, maybe it just looks slightly different. I mean, even in school, for those of us, I mentioned school, you know, um, my wife is uh, one of those frontline heroes, so to speak, working um, with kids at school. Um, specifically special needs kids and you know they're wearing masks they're wearing they're wearing all of it and it's just it's becoming you know that commonplace where it is hard because even in school that like, you have children that are supposed to be wearing what they're supposed to be wearing some people aren't and and we're really starting to see the importance of having this this understanding that uh, we have to you know adhere to these cer these certain you know environments that require that level of safety so um, you know, switching gears. Well, actually, part of this is about safety, of course. Um, I this was uh, reimagining seasonal events. I, uh, our, our great friend Marcus. I don't know if Marcus is joining us today, but uh, Marcus uh, retweeted this uh, Six Flags Great Adventure, a really cool little thirty-second Twitter teaser uh, video. Um, a, a little scary at times, a little uh, frightening, but it's this. Uh, there, it's the reimagined seasonal event for Hollow Fest. Um, so they are gonna they are gonna have the hall of as they are gonna you know do something completely different, but they have social distancing scare zones. And really here what I like about this story is that it is kind of the duality of like really two parks. You have your your regular operating calendar time and then your 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 special evening kind of events as, as the place safely turns into what a lot of us are, are really expecting if if you're able to open uh, and stay open if you're in a locale allows it. So they're they're using social distancing for their scare zones. They're putting their their scares behind um, their actors behind you know like chain link fence. And quite honestly, that's one of the more frightening elements of a of a scare is when they're they're banging on the fence. But you know with the darkness and everything, you're you're able to get that distance. So um, kudos to Six Flags. Um, it, it's going to be fun to watch and see how this goes. Obviously, a lot of uh, requirements that. That it's going to be operating hours that are only on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. You have to make a reservation. They're really emphasizing that um, there's going to be really limited uh, capacity 
Also, um, there's nothing indoor. So all these mazes are outdoor kind of events. It's all sort of outdoor and they're really spacing. So I'm really interested to see um, specifically all our friends that joined us on the webinar last week are, are hearing how that's gonna go um, as they open. Um, Claudette's uh, location has really been re-innovating re and, and doing some more things. They've kind of upped the ante. Um, uh, they had the Taste of Calico event, as you know, in Knott's Berry Farm. Some great press from the LA Times about rethinking theme parks. Um, the, the author, Todd Martins, I, I love this quote. Uh, Knott's Berry Farm last week felt more like a national park than a theme park. And, you know, um, Claudette, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but I'm a SoCal native. Knott's Berry Farm is near and dear to my heart. It's, it is like a national park. Um, I mean, it is a place that you just go visit to look at the amazingness of that location and experience it. So um, I just, you know, this is a great thing. So kudos to you and your team. Um, obviously you probably read this article. How's the excitement going over there at, at Knott's about, about this, this next reopening? Yeah, we're very excited, Randy. I mean, I to talk about the history of Knott's, 2020 was going to be our big 100th anniversary celebration. So, yeah, we'd been around for 100 years and started as a farm, of course. Um, but, yeah, it really does feel like a national treasure. And um, we're really excited about what we're doing here. And we're getting really, really positive feedback. So, yeah, I think we're happy. Yeah. Uh, so anybody has a question for Claudette about some of this? I mean, we're, we got some more industry updates to give, but I, I really love the feel of that. And I think I was telling Claudette that, you know, some of these locations, if you can open in some way, shape or form in, in some way and just let let your guests experience and walk through your attraction, you might not be able to open, you may not be able to serve food, but I think it's a really, it's a really healthy and therapeutic um, um, endeavor as well. Like I need that, I need to go visit attractions. And so, um, being able to visit and walk through and maybe not ride rides um, would be really great. I just hearing the music. I think Matthew and I have talked about this before. The music as you walk through, you know, a Disney park or a Universal park. I just want to hear the music. I found myself listening to some YouTubes of ride music um, lately just because I feel like I want to be walking through uh, those attractions. Um, but hey, I'll, Matthew, I'll turn it over to you on some pricing conversations. We've seen some new things happen here in the last couple of days, even. Yeah. Um, so so the, this specific um, item was it came out of Germany, specifically the the Wurzburg Museum of Modern Art in uh, Brenham, Germany. Germany. Um, very interesting idea to maybe uh, move from an entrance fee to instead an exit fee, and and really kind of pricing the experience based on the time that someone spends. Uh, you know, I think the goal there was really to to make the the attraction more accessible, ensure that folks were able to to stop by and 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 experience it, um, but in a way that that there was no you know hard barrier uh, of a full ticket price to do it. So what they had implemented and and done did some studies on um, was you know if someone pays one euro per ten minutes that they're in the attraction, um, what's the result of that? Uh, and specifically, what they saw is that you know over an an average of a four year period, um, the visitation was up seventy two percent, and the uh, ticket revenue uh, was up you know twenty eight percent. In 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 visits, um, just over the prior year, it was still up forty two percent, and revenue was down just slightly uh, for that. But one of the things I think that, you know, as as a lot of our attractions are looking for, you know, especially in the nonprofit or space of, of creating ambassadors and, and allowing folks to to connect with your mission, um, obviously driving visitation is, is a good way to to set um, that initial feeling about the attraction and then um, invite them back in. So I think, you know, this was a very intriguing way to maybe drive visitation um, and, you know, hold revenue at, a, at an appropriate level. Uh, so great, great uh, article to take a look at and, and a little bit more documentation that's available in that uh, there. You know, I, I like just yeah. sometimes reimagining how you are doing pricing and seeing what the, that effect has. I think it was Cheyenne Mountain. I, I, I don't have the exact. I'll, I'll look for it and I'll send it uh, in our email. But I think it's um, our Cheyenne Zoo. 
um, that gives away quarters to guests as they arrive and um, they can elect where they're gonna spend those quarters for donations. Um, but what they've seen, you know, I think some of the drivers are is that once you start giving people some quarters in their hands and show them how to connect with whatever your programming is or whatever your mission is and giving them that choice, you're starting to see more money moving into those spaces. So I'm interested from a nonprofit point of view, like, you know, rethinking this model might actually result in, in numbers that will increase, uh, that maybe go above and beyond what your, your normal rack rate is for your museum or your cultural attraction. So really, really cool information there. And then um, just yesterday, uh, we saw some changes come out of uh, Universal Orlando Resort, um, where following, I think, uh, Walt Disney World's lead um, a little, maybe a little bit over a year ago, um, of moving to kind of very uh, date-based pricing. Um, I, I think they had been doing uh, seasonal pricing for some of their one-day products up until this point. But now, um, if I choose to buy a two-day um, ticket, uh, based on the start date of that visit, um, I'm going to have different pricing. Uh, so you can kind of see there in the bottom right-hand side that, you know, it, there's quite quite a bit of variation throughout the week. So uh, starting your visit on uh, Sunday, uh, September th uh, the 13th, is $113, um, but if you were to start it on a Thursday or Friday, it steps up $4 to $117. So really trying to, you know, find that that ideal price that, you know, given the amount of demand um, can can achieve the the uh, uh, optimal revenue appears to be what, what they're going after with the amount of variation. I see some of um, our friends from Universal are, uh, are on the, the call that are giving some thumbs up to some of this the excitement around opening this. So that's really, really, really cool stuff. Hey, um, you know, I'll, going back this idea about pay, at, Nick, I want you to jump in here for a second. Sure. Um, well, we were just talking um, about money and pricing and rethinking. You actually, um, you you were making a little comment here in our, in our chat uh, about a museum that also has an interesting pricing model. Do you want to share that with us? Sure. Well, if you know Balboa Park, you know it's a collection of, well, there's about 30 cultural institutions, 17 of those are uh, museums. And so it's actually a great test bed. You know, they each have somewhat varying ideas about pricing and, you know, all those kinds of things. So we have a couple of instances. One is um, the, the San Diego uh, Museum, uh, the San Diego History Center has a pay forward program. So the, the notion is that you experience the history center and then on your way out, you pay for the next person's visit. And so it's kind of, you know, it's a little like a net promoter score. You know, would you recommend this to your, you know, to somebody else? Um, you know, we also have a, um, the uh, Museum of Photographic Arts has a pay what you wish, um, which is, again, I think they do that on the way out. Uh, they tried it on the way in and it was, you know, it was a low dollar value, on, but on the way out, it seems to be a lot higher. Um, so we have a number of, and plus we have free museums and we have paid museums. So we have a lot going on down there. Oh, that's really cool. And it's funny because, I mean, pay as you wish when you take, when you go to a, a for-profit space. I mean, that's some of what you're able to do here. When I'm looking at these universal prices, you know, the reality is I have seven, seven in our family. And so we have to think tactfully if we were going to go someplace. But knowing what your price is helps me make those decisions. And I think it's it's a great time to open up the these opportunities, try these things new. I'm really curious, I mean, if that, that pay forward campaign, there's there's so much altruism that I'm seeing right now. People have that pent up excitement. So maybe launching something like that as you reopen, if you're one of these, you know, 30% of our, our attendees that haven't opened yet. If you want to try something now and you're a nonprofit, this might be the time to do that because that person in line might be ready to make a, a significant donation to your mission because they're just so happy to be able to participate. So uh, got, you know, it's a very it's a very altruistic you know way of pricing it, and they've had a I, I believe they've had a fair amount of success with you know local philanthropists who really support the idea and you know, kind of grab their attention. Really cool. Good information. Hey, uh, we always want to ask, I'm sorry, we always want to answer uh, questions if possible. Um, I, and I want to just jump into Cherry's uh, question here about, um, or comments, they're saying about masks and stuff, and, 
you know, being the mass police, I, I think um, that's a challenge, right? That's a challenge, like what kind of masks you're, you're, you're allowed to wear. Uh, my advice to almost everyone is kind of take lead, look and see and hear and listen to what those attractions are, are allowing. I believe it was Disney that first said you couldn't allow certain ones, and then they they actually upped the ante and really made it clear if you're not able to wear your mask properly of this kind, you just can't come. So I would say if there is any gray area, if you're worried about that, um, use other attractions as as the benchmark, um, and then you know you can always say, oh, you know we we've, we've really taken our lead from Universal or Disney or whatnot. Um, these are the policies, and we think it's a good, safe policy um, to adhere to. So as long as you're transparent and you're communicating in advance, um, it's always, always good. And Sherry also notes that I, I think it's important to note, after being reopened for three months, and um, they're finding more people like are more upset with others not wearing masks. So maybe if you put enough reminders out there, your general guest audience will help assist you by modeling good behavior. And so maybe you don't have to get so involved in reminding, um, you know, guests, un unfortunately there was an incident at, I wanna say it was a Sesame Place. Was it Sesame Place, Matthew? Yes. Yeah, I got on, I think YouTube where, um, I mean, our, if you're in a lot of the attraction community forums that we were on, um, there was an incident with an employee who was just doing their job and was unfortunately, assaulted um, and uh, the community came down really hard and stringently about it. The best, you know, the more you over communicate your standards and your requirements, um, that's that's my advice. I'm sure it's everyone's advice on the on the call today. Um, so Matthew, um, I wanna shift gears a little bit but before we open it up to everybody, um, kind of report on some of this data. Um, everyone's making decisions. These are some of the tough decisions that we've seen. Um, hold on one second. My slide's not going to advance there. There we go. So, um, Matthew, why don't you share a little bit about the information from the poll? Yeah. So, um, of those that participated in today's poll um, and are attending, um, we've seen a little bit of, of folks that are having to make decisions right, uh, around pricing um, with, you know, about 9% of folks, you know, increasing prices. Um, you know, I, I would anticipate that that's to, to offset maybe a, a lower um, capacity or a slightly lower demand and about 9% of folks um, decreasing prices, uh, maybe to encourage kind of just uh, maybe offering a limit more limited experience and having to to adjust pricing to do that. Um, but really a, a a healthy chunk of folks that, you know, you know, maybe it's it's in the pricing realm, but it's it's really more focused on 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 a targeted promotion. And I think we've heard uh, in, in prior discussions that that's probably really um, wise a wise decision to make um, versus kind of changing uh, a marquee rate or a, a standard pricing so that um, we're not necessarily living with the change um, in, into the future as well. Staffing, obviously, um, I, and I think, you know, probably there's there's very few industries that haven't been affected from this um, with ours being uh, certainly most impact or, or one of the most impacted. And so a lot of folks have, have had to decrease staffing. So about 80% of folks um, with a small amount of folks having to increase staffing. Um, and then marketing, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a balance there. You know, there's some folks that are, are increasing that marketing, but about 20% of the folks that, that uh, polled uh, responded that way, um, and about 29% having to pull back on some of that marketing. Um, you know, interesting, I, it looks like, uh, I believe, Bill, there was a question we had about opening a new exhibit. I'm actually trying to find the question, maybe this might be a time. Uh, Bill, are you there? Can you jump in? Yeah, I think yeah. Darlene mentioned that that they're going to be opening up a new exhibit on on Friday to help um, try to to drive it uh, increased attendance. Oh, so that's great. Yeah, being able to do something new right now um, amidst all this to to get that general uh, excitement. Um, hey, well, Jonathan, I want to talk to you a little bit about about some of this. I mean, because. I, you had to go through a lot of this, you know, um, why don't you share a little bit about um, what decisions that you made? Why don't you give us a little bit of an update about the USS Iowa? Where are you? Tell us your story a little bit and maybe um, 
what big changes have you had to make in the in the last few months here as you reopened? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Randy. Uh, you know, obviously, Los Angeles is a very dynamic area at this point. We we uh, had a shutdown and started to go into reopening and in subsequent phases, and then you know scaled back back down into really what I would call phase two B, although it's a really adjusted. Um, you know, we were really dynamic in doing so. Uh, you know, when we shut down in March, we immediately started implementing measures, um, including furloughs, cost cuts, power shutoffs, um, contacting vendors, contacting our uh, our landlord, and and really started preserving cash. You know, I, I got to give it a shout out. I know some of my uh, the Iowa family is on the uh, the web web call here, and I see my CFO's name on there, who I'm sure is giving me all kinds of trouble. Um, but anyways, it, it wouldn't have happened without them. And, you know, we implemented a plan of of communicating, transparent communication, um, you know, and, and really taking a dynamic approach. Uh, you know, interesting enough, because of a lot of the relationships we've built over the years um, and following what's going on in the news media, you know, we rotated, we shut down, we started shutting down power, started hoarding cash. I mean, that was one of our goals is hoard cash um, and prepare for the, for the long term on it. Um, well, follow, following the news media and staying on top of what was occurring in, in Europe and um, what may change and what some of the governor's objectives were. And, and we kind of rolled into um, our first month and a half, two months. We helped support the USNS Mercy mission that came to L.A. here um, and, and had some of the advanced team based on the ship and started planning our reopening and, and some of those things. So it's really a wide, wide range of things to address them. You know, as I mentioned before, I. Don't want to spend hours on it, but it's really uh, it's really looking at reducing expenses, you know, increasing revenue, um, targeted uh, impacts, and and figuring out how to hoard cash for the long haul. Well, I, I, I I'm actually frantically trying to get a, a slide. Is is that is that medical vessel? Is that what that picture is on your on your website? Yeah, that, you may see that the big white the white vessel with the red cross on the side of it going by the Iowa. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm bringing I'm bringing that up um, right here. That's yeah. it right there, right? That's it right there. And wow, uh, we built obviously great relationships with the Navy because we do have a Navy ship, but primarily we're also lead for LA Fleet Week. You know, it, it, going into a deeper depth, it's we've always looked at our museum as what is our role as a greater impact to the community from an economic standpoint, um, impact to veterans, impact to to the school youth, and so. Our attendance is not a primary driver for us. It's a piece of what we do, but it's how do we impact the overall community that we, we are surrounded by. Um, and, and so we we kind of moved and, and focused a little of our attention a few different areas, uh, prepared for a reopening. As I say in my messages on a weekly basis, I believe this is going to be a 12 to 18 month um, long road to see a ramp up, and we may get to 80 to 85 percent of attendance by the time we get to that point. Um, but really, it's you know not personalizing the pandemic. I mean, the great thing, you know, this this is I, it's horrible to say, but I've helped restructure businesses and recessions and and businesses that are one off. Um, the one thing that's in the pandemic is we're not alone. I mean, we're we're not alone. We're all in this. We're all dealing with our own situation. And and when you're not alone, you have to realize not to personalize it and start addressing the issues and taking them on and figuring out how to preserve cash to to last out the long haul. Uh, it's really good information. And I mean, actually, um, you know, what I, I have so many, you have so many good pieces of information. And I, I think what you just said is, is, you know, I, I love this quote. It, it is what it is. It's going to pass. You know, there, you're, we're going to move on to the next thing. But um, what, what was one of the toughest decisions that you had to make as the leader of this attraction? Um, as COVID approached? You know, the, the, the toughest decision is always the impact it has on the people that that work for you and the people you love. Um, I mean, they they help get you to where you're at, and those are always the toughest decisions. But I mean, once again, I it, it may sound a little callous, but we're in a pandemic. I mean, if, if I've got an obligation to protect our organization for the future and make sure we're in it for the long haul, and so therefore decisions have to be made. Um, so I, I don't look at them as tough decisions. I look at them as strategic decisions. Um, and, and what are those decisions? You got two two sides of it. I mean, I put it really simple: reduce expenses, increase revenue. And how do those two sides look? And how do you put strategic decisions to do you know something in both of them? Because you can't you know you don't focus on one of them. 
um, you know, and stay ahead out of that curve. You, you stay ahead and watch things like this webinar and, and see what other folks are doing and how you may um, adapt them. But uh, let's face it, economic recessions occur, booms occur, pandemics occur, fires occur. I mean, th this is the nature of life. And, and we just happen to have another blip on the radar to deal with that may be 12 to 18 months. Um, and, and we're just gonna address it and make sure we, we sustain what we do for, for the long while. Um, I think that's important from, from what our role is in the community and the impact that we make. Well, one of the things that I love, and, and we'll send a link to your, your site, is um, I love, well, you have actually a whole bunch of information, um, if you just go to your website, you've got great newsletters and you're actually including a lot of this information just in your regular uh, communications to, I would say, your teams, but also to your followers. And I, I think it's important to walk through kind of your battle plan. You know, um, we've heard some of this before, but I, I really I love hearing from a leader in an attraction organization to just go back and kind of go back to the basics here. Um, so why don't you walk us through your essentials and your communication strategy? Okay, Okay. so the essentials number one is maintaining my physical and mental health. I know it's one of the hardest things in the morning. Um, I think we all wanna gorge on pizza and gorge on horrible foods, especially during a time like now. Um, but you know, being able to take that hour off in the morning and, and really get your mindset in the right place so you don't overreact and you're able to think clearly, stop and, and think through it. And always remind yourself, I mean, that saying, it is what it is, this too shall end for me, um, really is a, a saying that I remember in the 2009 recession, because I was I was dealing with a different business even at that point. That one line has helped me get through so many things, because I realize that I'm just at a point in time. I'm just at one day in the middle of this, and this will end, and every day that clicks away is one day closer to the end of it. Um, you know, and, and remembering yesterday is is yesterday. There's nothing we can do to change yesterday. We can't change a pandemic. It it launched in March. We shut down. We can't change it. I mean, we we would all love to change it. Everybody on this call would love to change it, but we can't change it. Um, but what we can do is look at a new new future and reinvent ourselves. And and remember that this uh, will not be the last um, you know downtime we see. And and coming out of it, it won't be the last boom time we see. So just always being prepared for how to address those issues because it's going to be a cycle up and down. It's a roller coaster. Um, researching and stay ahead of the curve, and I'll, I'll throw a few little stories in here. But um, you know, I, I go to news.google.com. I search a few different things every day. I search, you know, Hawaii. When's my Hawaii vacation finally going to kick off again? Um, but I also, you know, search museums and, and attractions and see what they're doing, and search treatments vaccines and treatments, you know, we, we don't see in mainstream media the fact that there's a tremendous number of treatments that are coming out right now that are that are really in great testing phase and probably out before the vaccines. There's some incredible things happening. And you can start to time it and start to look at what you're looking at in that, that realm. But for example, Gavin Newsom, uh, the governor of California back in April, started talking about museums and said, look, this they're going to be in phase 3B. And when I saw phase 3B, I said, well, outdoor museums don't necessarily fit into the same realm as an indoor museum because you have some recycled air and that type of stuff. And I called somebody I knew up at the governor's office and said, look, how, how can we address these and break them out? Because in my opinion, and, and, and no offense to anybody on the phone, but in my opinion, a zoo and aquarium can't walk away from their animals and stop feeding them. And, and a battleship like we're sitting on, I can't walk away from the ship and expect that some kind of damaging situation is not going to occur in the largest port in the country. And so some of us have some real situations that we may be able to adapt our businesses accordingly, you know, like kind of what Knotts is doing. How can we adapt our businesses to get people in to, to, to see what we're doing? So staying out ahead of it and trending and figuring out how you're going, going to adjust what you're doing accordingly. Um, and you know the plan is going to change. It's going to plan. It's going to change every morning. It's going to change every afternoon. Um, it, it just is what it is. It's going to change. You reopen, and all of a sudden your attendance is doubling, and then you're shut down the next week. You know it is what it is. Um, you got to change with it. You got to grow with it, and and implement other measures. Hey, Jonathan, can can I ask um, from a, a leader like yourself, you, you obviously have teams that probably get caught up and, and and need to be reminded of kind of that it is what it is, it, it, this shall pass. Are there any any techniques or ways that you've used to kind of help your teams to kind of, you know, 
keep that front of mind and not to get, you know, down a rabbit hole where they you, it becomes all consuming and, and overwhelming? Um, you know, it, it's the nature of the beast um, in some of that. You know, I, I look at my role as CEO. My role is not a manager. My role is a coach. My role is a cheerleader. My role is to bring the people along uh, and communicate. And that's really the next slide, Randy, is on the communication side, is to focus on the right communication. And, and this is one of the really hardest things that you can do is communicate by being vulnerable, honest, honest, and transparent. Um, doing that with your team. I, I will give everybody a hint on this phone, this phone call. We spent a lot of years trying to address all those issues. Uh, you know, try to get out ahead of them. And there was always somebody that felt like they didn't hear something. And I mean, this is just an ongoing issue when you get to a, an organization with size. When we started sending out weekly updates that were vulnerable, honest, and transparent, it changed things dynamically. And we started that five years ago. Um, it, and folks started to align with where we were going. The whole team started to align with where we were going. They knew what we what we were trying to work on. They knew where we were headed, what some of the issues are. Um, it, and <laughs> what's interesting, and, and I put a note for myself over here, but if you look at that in the communication, and it's very uncomfortable to be vulnerable, um, honest, and transparent on an email that that started out to our team, and it was really to align everybody, which I got to say, I, I'm sure I've got a ton of team members on here. They are all aligned. We don't look at the past. We're all looking at the future, and we're still surprised people think about the past. Um, but that alignment came from a constant message, a consistent communication and being vulnerable. Um, but in doing so, it, it took a big step um, uh, for me to take a step and start sending that out to, you know, 100,000 people a week um, through our email lists and, and through, you know, our Facebook and our social media and all of that and take it a step further. Now, that was a big step. And, and I was concerned about how that may appear or how vulnerable I really was and and what we're really opening the door on. And I will let folks know on, on this call that, that are nonprofits specifically, um, I'll give you an example of that. We had a donor in the middle of April that's been following us on social media and our email list for who knows how long, and we didn't even know who they were. We weren't even stewarding them that called us up and said, I'm sending you a significant gift, and he sent us a half a million dollars. Just because our constant regular communication that was transparent and honest and being vulnerable. The support we get from the what I call the Iowa family and the Iowa community is absolutely incredible. And that is because we're regularly communicating what our real situation is and where we're at, and what we're dealing with and, and how we're addressing it. Um, and, and I think that's to me shows that 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 helps, but it, it aligns everybody in the same alignment. Um, it's helped tremendously for us. Well, and that is something that struck me as well in our conversations as well and me going to your website. Um, um, you can just go right. I, this was a, a, an example of that that I really liked. I mean, this, you you had there was some really terrible weather in in the state of Iowa recently, and you know you you went right out and communicated not just that, but there's also remembering um, you know Jerry here and talking a little bit about um, your you know the heartfelt message to the state of Iowa, the namesake for the ship. And so I, I do love that transparency. And, and I think whether you're a nonprofit or a, a for-profit, you still have that, that fan base. And we'll use that word fan fanatically for a reason, but I mean, people are very interested in what's happening. And so, so you know, whether you love Knott's Berry Farm and you just want to make a stroll to the park or, or whether you're part of this, this battleship family or, or uh, all the ships in Fleet Week and these other things, so I think it is great to see how attractions have have really increased their their methods of communication during this time a little shout out there you even have this um you know uh operation crush covid campaign which is not just this charity but other things that you're doing to uh try to to push push the cause going forward well so and, and, and randy i do want to mention one thing to the nonprofits that are on this 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 call and i think it's really important is um don't forget about your volunteer base I mean, they're part of your family as well. I think a lot of times volunteers are looked at as, as substandard to the rest of the team. For us, they are part of the team. We have volunteer managers in, in, on, on the ship. Um, they're part of that team. But I will tell you, when, when we are vulnerable and we communicate and, and we say things like, hey, we're, we're, you know, we're short on cash and we're not going to be able to buy paint this month, I've, we've had volunteers come out of the woodwork and buy paint. 
And and so realize that these folks are supporters. They love you. They're donors. You just have to involve them and engage them and let them be part of what you're doing and be part of that family because you already have a huge base of people that want to support you. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm going to I'm going to jump gears over here and uh, you, we've got more to talk about. And um, but Claudette, I'm going to I want to go back to communication for a second. Um, Claudia, you work for John. I mean, like a le- he's a legend uh, in our industry. Um, great communicator, great friend of IAPA. He's uh, been on committees. If if you, he's the type of guy that will answer emails and and really just be. A, he's a great communicator. And um, what is the communication like at Knots uh, as you're going through this period of time? This is a quote that came out. Um, this is actually part of. I want to I want to back up before I ask you what that question is. I want to. Back up one second. Um, uh, on August 4th, there was a Cedar Fair made a, a lot of announcements. Um, the company did a great job communicating across all of their, their regions um, with targeted messages from each of the low, each of your the attractions. And John had to regrettably talk about closing Not Scary Farm. So you've got a really a real bummer event happening there where so many people love that event. But then on the same token, talking about the successes, um, maybe I, I just want to ask, what's the communication like right now? What is happening um, behind the scenes at, at Knott's Berry Farm? Sure, and you're right. John is a great communicator and I'm really fortunate to work for him. Um, but it, I also have to stay, say it starts at the very top of Cedar Fair. The, the communication has been excellent from day one. Um, you know, our our CEO, um, Richard Zimmerman, he's been in constant communication with the team and, you know, they, they send out frequent updates and, uh, you know, just keeping us up to date on what they're doing and what's happening um, here at the park. We have we have a lot of meetings, a lot of, you know, virtual meetings, obviously, um, but we have a weekly meeting just on reopening a reopening task force and you know, as much as we're doing taste of calico, moving on to taste of knots, we want to be in that constant state of uh, able to reopen. So as soon as, you know, it's safe to do so and the governor gives us the uh, the thumbs up, we want to be in that space. And so, um, yeah, communication, I couldn't say much more than Jonathan. He expressed how important it is. And it is. And I agree with Jonathan, too. It's not just communication. It's it's that honesty and that sometimes sometimes brutal honesty. Um, but you also have to, you know, remember who your audience is and um, reminding people of the, the positives. So that's what John has done here. You know, yeah, we had to cancel Scary Farm this year, um, but we've got a lot of other things going on and we want to make sure that we keep our guests engaged. We keep our associates employed as much as possible. And it's a really interesting balance, especially in a finance role to, you know, I agree with what everyone has said. You want to minimize your expenses. You want to optimize your revenue. And you don't know what the landscape is going to be when you do events, when you do anything. You don't know what the demand is going to be. And you do a lot of a lot of analysis. There's a lot of forecasting going on, a lot of break evens, a lot of and then a lot of communication. You know, these are not decisions that are made in a vacuum. We, we go up the ladder. We are holding hands to, um, you know, to get approvals for these things. And so, um, yeah, it's important. It's critical. So, Claudette, uh, when what what are some of the things that go behind that decision making? So, like, like you, if you just if you decide, hey, we're going to go ahead and cancel this uh, Halloween event, or you know, kind of, what are some of the things that you bake into that analysis to kind of arrive at that decision? Well, to some degree, it's the level of uncertainty and how you know you talk about when you're going to reopen again. And right now, we don't have any idea when we're going to reopen again. Um, and so, because when the governor shut down like indoor dining and all that, I think it was July 1st, um, you know, we kind of look at that and we say, okay, so when he's ready to start reopening again, he'll probably start again with that level, reopening indoor dining, reopening some other things, probably won't quite be at the park level yet. So so you're just looking at a, a long period of uncertainty. So the, there's that. Um, but of course, the other things that go into that decision-making are, um, 
again, it's the financial an analysis. You know, what what would we need to spend to launch? What would we need to, um, when would we need to start it? What's your trigger date to get started on it? You know, you can't do a lot of things if you don't have a runway to do it in. So if you need four weeks of runway and you don't know when you're reopening, that starts to limit your runway. Claudette, I think that's what I really liked about how you guys did pivot in a way that I think uh, was pretty awesome um, with, with your programs. Um, actually, I'm gonna go back was like, this is a slide we actually shared I don't even know when this was. It was probably in, in sometime in the middle of July in a webinar. So I pulled that exact slide and I was kind of saying, hey, you guys are doing something different. And, and, and obviously this is a big pivot and a big change. Um, you very quickly sold out of all of those events, um, the Taste of Calico. And this, this was really just a section. And was this just uh, someone's idea at, at a table or... I, I, I'm curious how it came up. Well, it came up early on, honestly. It came up really early on after the lockdown. And I think it was just, you know, we're again, trying to find ideas as we've all talked about, trying to generate some revenue and minimize some um, expense loss. And so it came up, we talked about it probably for a couple of weeks, I don't know. And we did some analysis, we did some, PowerPoint. And then it looked like we were, you know, getting in that phase of reopening California. So we saw that momentum, things were reopening again. And so we pivoted from focusing on a taste of event like we're doing to reopening. So all of our energy went back to, okay, we're going to open up. And when Disney announced that they were going to open on July 17th, we kind of looked at that and said, okay, if, if they have the confidence to go out and announce a date, we feel pretty good about reopening. And um, anyway, as we all know, that didn't happen and things quickly reversed. And when we quickly reversed and realized, okay, we're, we're back to square one and we don't really, again, like I said, we don't know when that reopening is gonna happen. All right, let's dust off this, this idea that we had a few weeks ago and um, let's see if you know we can make it happen. So yeah, it was kind of um, something we had originally thought of and, and pulled back and, Turns out that's what we needed to do. Yeah, that's great. Plus, it, like John was saying, you're starting to engage your teams, you get your staff, so you're kind of moving yeah. in the direction of getting them primed and ready to reopen for everyone. Well, exactly. I mean, what we're doing now, again, at a smaller scale, but it's really given us a chance to, you know, again, the safety of our guests is number one and of our associates. And it took some time. I mean, we, first of all, it took some time even before we did the Taste of event to recognize, okay, what, what do we need for all of the safety of our guests, the social distancing, um, you know, all of that. It, it took some time to put together. But now that we've been open for several weekends, we've also been able to make it more efficient. We recognize where we've needed to staff up for the, you know, again, we've always prided ourselves on the cleanliness of this park, but we had to take it up a notch to an even, you know, higher level. and. Um, yeah, like I said, though, after several weeks, we've also gained efficiencies at doing it and understanding, you know, where we need to focus more and where we may be able to pull back a little bit. Yeah, well, that, one, oh, Sorry. one of the big takeaways I, I'm getting from this is, you know, you're spending a lot of time coming up with ideas and thinking through um, different options. Um, and at times you might shelve some of those, but we need to make sure that we put them on a really good shelf that we can find easily and go back to, because with everything changing, we don't want to lose sight of one of those great ideas that we had that we we passed on initially. Um, so really having good organization of, of those ideas that are, I, I would assume coming in from a bunch of different business units and areas and, and really making sure that that's efficiently managed. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, these, you know, the calls that we're on, it does encompass all of the different disciplines within the business and um, a lot of feedback, a lot of good ideas and a lot of good, you know, robust discussion about them. And Claudette, and as we talk about runway, um, you know, I do like uh, you've expanded. It's 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 actually an increase in price, right? So taste of cost is how you added with some more, price. With with more tastings. So more we've tastings. also yeah. Um 
I love, I have to say, I mean, I always go back to some of the marketing. I, I love this picture of the gear because um, the previous shots of Calico, you understood if you, if you love Bob's Berry Farm, you immediately were like, oh, I'm going to be in that section of the park, right? And so now I'm, I'm expanding this marketing vision here is, is showing a ride in the background, which kind of excites me. I even told you, Claudia, like I would love to go and go <laughs> just see the rides going. That's how much of a fan I am. I would, if you just ran the rides and played the music, I'd be just happy to be watching <laughs> a little bit. Um, but you've also then the runways moved, and and I, I do like that you've been able to take advantage of uh, some of the the reopening. The the hotel can now open, um, you know, obviously safely, and you're doing these packages together as well. A really, you know, a really discounted pro program here, um, but that's obviously designed to get people into the hotels. Um, clearly, you're probably working on that staycation market. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if I wasn't in Tennessee, I'd be right there. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, to your point, when we did Taste of Calico, just in Ghost Town, and as you as you mentioned, we sold out really quickly. So we felt that you know we did have that that opportunity to expand the footprint a little bit, um, welcome more guests back in, and again just expand the experience. And um, we're really excited about it. We're really excited about Taste of Knots and. Again, reopening the hotel, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of interest. And again, I think what feeds us as a company right now is the responses we're getting from our guests. I can't tell you some of the the letters I have seen just melt my heart, and it's um, it's really it's wonderful to hear that we're providing uh, what we are providing to so many people. And and I agree. I mean, I'm probably the biggest fan myself. I think what we're doing is great. That's awesome. Awesome. Hey, hey, um, going back to kind of what Matthew had asked Claudette about what's behind these decision making processes. Nick, I'm, I'm, I, I'm really excited to hear your insight on this because, you know, you, you really got a, a plan of, of, of how to help nonprofits move forward and make these decisions. So I want to turn it over to you. If you're facing a tough decision, if you you don't even know what to do next. I mean, many of the attractions on the call are in that position, or some of them have reopened, and of course, they, their their numbers aren't aren't where they want to be, or they're they're focusing on wrong things. Can you take us a little bit through the journey of what you like to? How do you guys start that process when you work alongside an attraction? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, really, we're, what we're trying to help is to provide some structure around those conversations. Um, you know, and because oftentimes these are kind of big conversations to have. Um, and so, you know, how do you simplify it? How do you take that first step to trying to figure out, OK, what do we stop doing? What do we keep on doing? So we have this very and I'm going to recommend you do this exercise. Um, we have this simple, you, you know, any self-respecting consultant would figure out a way to put up a two by two matrix um, as part of a presentation. And so here's mine. Um, but it, it's a really simple it's a really simple matrix. You've got financial sustainability on on the horizontal and you've got kind of impact vision on the vertical. And so you split it into four quadrants and you say, OK, if something's low impact and low sustainability, you know, maybe you stop doing it or you figure out how to move it to the right or move it up. Um, you know, if you if it's low financial sustainability, but high vision impact, you know, maybe that's OK, you know, because maybe there are some things that you do that define the institute, you know, your institution from a kind of high level kind of serving the community standpoint. But you've really got to balance that with something that is highly sustainable, which might be low impact and low vision. You know, ultimately, you want to be in that operating everything in that top right hand corner. Um, but, you know, we wish that we could all do that, but but you can't. And so really the exercise is, you know, you get a whiteboard, you get a bunch of people together and you start, you know, and no program is is too big or too small. So you might say, well, you know, website, where where is our website? Well, it's clearly high impact, high vision. Um, but, you know, given all the costs associated with it, you know, is, is it operating, you know, financially sustainably or, you know, maybe you have a, a lecture program, you know, which is maybe highly sustainable but, but low impact so as long as you've got this balance you're good and and what tends to happen is if and i you have to have a cfo in the in the room when you're doing this exercise and and my my strong advice is the cfo sits back while she watches the rest of the team 
put all their post-its on the top right-hand corner and then comes in and says, well, if that were true, then we wouldn't be in the financial difficulty that we're in. And then, you know, the CFO comes in and, and moves everything to the to the bottom. So, but it's a very valuable exercise. You know, it, it allows you to talk specifically about small things. It allows you to kind of, you know, take, how do you eat an elephant? You know, you take one bite at a time and it, it kind of allows you to do that. And so how do you do that? So you identify, okay, well, we think this is low impact or low sustainability or whatever it is. And so if you go to the next slide. Um, well, actually, I love how you said post-its, right? Because I mean, we're, we're a post-it family over here and, you know, like putting the post-it notes. And what I, what I loved about it is when, when you and I kind of chatted about this in practicality, the idea of just getting a bunch of people in a room and just letting every because it, this gives everybody who has, who champions a project or who has a team or runs an attraction or is in charge of food it lets them write down on paper what what it is that they're a part of in your attraction but then yeah then the teams need to to put it up there for everyone to see so so, the so fact what, that, yeah what you'll notice a, a little detail in this is so you know my highly optimistic four quadrant um, exercise actually turned into, you know, an eight quadrant because you can see that blue dotted line because everybody was like, well, you know, it's a little, um, it's it's not as high vision as we think it might be, or, you know, they ne needed, mm -hmm. a, you know, a kind of a second differentiator to actually position um, those things. But again, it's it's a great exercise to go through. And, and for anybody who's looking for an online post-it environment, there's a there's a website called Miro, which is M-I-R-O dot com. Um, it has a whole suite of, of tools, but it has a fantastic post-it environment, collaborative post-it environment. So we do these things online now, even, um, you know, even when we're still working, doing these workshops, uh, we can accomplish them online. And it's it's pretty much just the same um, experience. So, Nick, I, I know that you weren't talking about this as a communication tool, but it, it, to me, it looks like it's also a great way to have the appropriate communication across disciplines. So I know it was it was a, a, a great comment you made about what the CFO would do. But a, a lot of times I think that a, a folks aren't realizing that, hey, what I think is high value and high profitability and whatnot is really not. And and I need help knowing where I should focus. And, and this sounds like a, a great way to do that. That's absolutely right. Um, it because it, it does foster that cross you know cross discipline conversation because you know every department will think you know all their programs are you know high vision high impact and but then you get into this conversation because you've got to start making some decisions around okay you know we have some goals we've got to reduce some you know we've got to reduce expenses you know or and so it gives you that that framework to be able to do that but it does illuminate what's going on across the rest of the organization because oftentimes i think you know pe pe folks are busy they don't really understand what you know what a program that another department or division is doing so it's a really good uh tool to be able to do that and and it's very simple so there you go there's miro yeah that, that does look like fun thanks for the advice so we'll we'll, we'll send everybody the link it is this looks like a, a great tool it, 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 and you know, if you've got small teams, it's uh, it's a, it's a free, you know, there's a freemium version of it, um, and uh, it, it's I highly recommend it. It has a whole suite of things like customer journey mapping. I mean, you can actually take post its and and move it into a customer customer journey map. It does a whole bunch of ideation type things. That's really cool. Well, and so you got all these post its, and then what's what's next? So then, what's next is okay. You focus on the bottom left corner. And either you say, okay, the in the bottom left, we've got low impact, low vision, low financial sustainability. You know, we're all agreed. We may just nix that, you know, depending on the urgency of the decision you've got to make, just just nix it. You know, sometimes you get, you know, we've been in situations where the the wisdom of the crowd is, okay, everything in there gets nixed and, and we'll focus on the low financial sustainability stuff. But then sometimes you'll get people who will make a very compelling argument about why you know, it, it should stay. And if that's the case, then you focus on, okay, so how do we move it to the right or how do we move it up? Ideally, you want to move it up and right. And so because you've got this, this mix of, you know, kind of quantitative, you know, financial stuff and qualitative, you know, vision impact stuff, you've got to figure out if you're going to move something up the vision impact, it's like, well, it's not necessarily about generating the revenue and the numbers. It's more about the, the kind of brand and the inspiration. So you can, 
we, we kind of bin the the metrics that you might want to start looking at you know so from you know quantitative quantitative on the left to qualitative on on the right and so you might say okay we're going to figure out how to measure brand for example so well how do you do that well you start looking at you know the kind of press you're getting the, you know the media coverage you know what kind of ratings uh, and, and positivity you're getting on social media third party rating sites you know if you're doing a, a net promoter score you know how, how do you start moving that 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 thing up on the on the far right you've got this inspiration which is you know probably highly kind of manual you're going to do surveys those kinds of things but then on the on the you know the, the left hand side if you're trying to boost that revenue so you know you start measuring these things um ensuring that you're balancing the revenue uh because oftentimes when you have this conversation you know particularly when the cfo steps in and says you know people say well you know we got 300 people to our um our lecture and then the cfo says yeah well it was only five bucks and you know it took five people and so you know you're you're really in the hole with that so you've got to figure out how to how to balance um all those things and i think you know, certainly the challenge for a lot of uh, nonprofits is they have a lot of data, they don't have a lot of insight. And so, particularly you know, when, we, when we're working with a with a, an organization, you know, they they spend this much time gathering the data together, and then you know this much time analyzing it. So we figure out how do you flip that? You know, how do you spend this much time gathering the data, and then this much time spent on the on deriving insight and figuring out how to move it uh, how to move it along. So that's where. So then, you know, we start. You start looking at KPIs. Um, you know, we we try and encourage institutions to think about OKRs. If you're familiar with um, OKRs, it's a OKRs a a way of flipping a, a KPI. So, you know, KPIs give you the opportunity to report on historic data too much. So it's you know at your monthly meeting, it's like so you know our attendance was this much last month. You know, and attendance is our KPI as opposed to OKRs, which say next month. You know we're going to increase attendance by two percent you know in over four weeks so you kind of flip it and because i think the data driven evaluative cultures need to be um institutions need to move that way because oftentimes they, they really they really don't and this exercise actually really raises the visibility of why it's important uh, to be capturing metrics and, and capturing it as automatically um, as you can mm. Nick, is, has there been any situations or any examples where you found that metrics helped make a better decision than, than the gut feel, right? Like, I mean, there's so many folks that have been in this industry for a while that have been operating in attraction for a while, and, and maybe they feel like, hey, I can just go by gut. I don't need all of this this fancy stuff. Like, has there been any situations where you found that maybe it really did help? So, right, yeah. So we call that anecdotal conclusions. And so, you know, it, it, it happens all the time, and it's the passion. And, and, you know, and we try not to to totally dismiss gut feeling because you know if, if you're a 25-year professional in the field and you have a gut feeling about something you know it, it's based on 25 years of experience so you, you shouldn't just dismiss it out, out of hand um you know oftentimes it's an emotional attachment to something that you're trying to address with you know just the facts now kind of thing and so um we had i'll give you actually i'll give you then you know sometimes it's better to Give an example of the opposite um, to to make the statement. So you know we we went we worked with an institution um, and looked at five years of their exhibition history and said, okay, what what are the kind of big dimensions that define those um, those exhibitions? So you know are they national or international? You know it was a, a visual arts place, so was it you know the, the type of visual art that we're displaying? You know is it three dimensional? Is it culture? So really kind of big buckets. And then you go back and you say, okay, how successful was were those exhibitions, and and did which buckets did they fall into? And so then you use that to say, okay, if we need to create a, you know, what what's what what was the most successful ex exhibition we we did, and and it was there commonality in the successful ones in in those big buckets, and it turns out, you know, pretty much there are. And so we said, okay, for your you know your forthcoming exhibition, you know, they already had an exhibition planned out. Uh, for 18 months, you know, we said those three exhibitions are not going to be successful based on prior history because they are not these kind of attractive um, buckets uh, and, and kind of themes that have been successful previously. And sometimes, you know, passion says, um, well, we're still going to do them. Um, and then in that case, you know, you kind of 
plan B is okay, then we've got to do a better job in promoting those those things. You know, you 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 understand that if if you're by their very nature, some of those exhibitions were successful because of the themes. If you're not using those themes, then you've got to you've got to boost some other way of ensuring that that thing is um, financially sustainable. So, you know, you're always you're always trying to not dismiss um, gut feeling, but you're you're trying to influence decisions based on hardcore facts. Yeah, and I actually I'm I'm going to pivot over for a second, Nick, and I want to talk about this philosophy about you know simplifying that process i'm going to go back to um to to jonathan you you had said it earlier about you know talking about passion like we have a, a very simple plan right it's just everything is about reducing expenses and, and increasing revenue um what types did, did you did you have conversations about programming? Did you have conversations about these other things? And, and how did you get to the decisions that you needed to make to cancel things? Because one of the big ones, and you might want to talk about it as well, is like Fleet Week. You're in charge of all of Fleet Week in Los Angeles, which is a huge event. So this, I'm, I'm curious how you were handling the decision-making process. Well, you know, you got to involve the the constituents and those that affects the most. You know, it's going to affect, affect your team. It's going to affect the community. It's going to affect... Um, you know, the leadership of of other organizations, potentially, you know, Fleet Week and Iowa have two different uh, two different involvements of constituency. You know, if I look at Fleet Week, I'm talking to the Navy, I'm talking to the mayor's office, I'm involving some of those local folks in the conversation saying, where are we going? How is this going to impact us? How do we change it? Right. If I look at Fleet Week right now, we're we're actually working on a virtual Fleet Week in partnership with uh, the USO and the mayor's office and the Navy for this year. But then we started having that conversation about how do we remain relevant and how do we keep the communication out there, but how do we not burn a lot of cash in doing so, right? How What's that balance? What's striking that balance in, in doing something? And then when you start to look at expense cuts or revenues, I, I always like to look at the biggest thing. You know, I, I like to say the squeaky wheel that has, has the grease or, or whatever that phrase is. You know, our phones are getting, you know, when you start delaying payments to accounts payable and folks, those are the people that are going to call you. And usually it's the person that matters least that's going to call you the most. You know, don't avoid the call, but you need to let them know really where you're at and maybe send them $10 a month. I mean, just talk to them about donating it back. Um, you know, see some of those services you may not need, right? If you're closing down, do you really need the seven day a week, 24 hour a day security guard? Or can you lock the doors and seal it up and put on the alarm? And maybe only do security once or twice a week, or can you do it to a roving patrol? And and starting to look at those major costs, you know, in, in our case, our major costs we look down, you have staff and number one. And you know, when you're running a 1943 battleship, you're at twenty five thousand dollars a month in power. How do we look at those costs and change those significantly? How do we ensure that we're able to sustain the the ship in our power solution? And within three days, we re rewired the critical infrastructure. And it basically re reduce expenses, increase revenue, and determine what is critical versus what's essential, you know, versus the next level, what's discretionary. And critical really means what is absolutely necessary to maintain where you're at, right? To to get to where you're going. And that that's a really, you know, I, I say any decision is actually just a decision. It's not a tough decision. But when you're working with the group of folks, your CFO, um, you know, the, the head of accounting, your chief operating officer and these folks, and you're looking at it and saying, okay, what do we do? These, these, this is what we're looking at. If we, if we cut education, what's that impact? Is there restricted monies to pay for education? If we cut veterans, what's that impact? Is there restricted monies to cover that? If we cut, do we need ticketing? Should I keep the ticketing folks on board just because that's the nice thing to do and burn through you know, fifty thousand dollars in three months ago. Uh oh, I'm out of money, and the organization's gone. Or, or do we look at furloughing the ticketing folks because we know we're not going to be able to open those ticket windows? And and so it's really looking at each one of those and and ranking them accordingly. The the A to Z ranking is what I call it. What is most critical, all the way down to, or what's the least critical to the most critical in expense cuts, or vice versa in the revenue side? And where are you making money? I mean, if you don't know. Where, where you're actually generating net revenue off or revenue to be able to cover your costs, then you got to dig into that pretty pretty quickly. 
because you may actually be running a program that's a net loss and has been for years. And and now if it's a net loss, you might as well just cut your, your losses right now. And now's your chance to cut it, reinvent it, change it, create something new. Um, but you know, methodically looking through that and moving quickly, you're not going to get everything in the first weeks. You're not going to give everything in the first months. But if you're able to cut you know, 20 or 25 percent expenses in the top three or four expense line items in the first week, um, you know, you're you're cutting the bleeding quicker, and then you could start to drill into it and start you know diving into where you're going with it. I like I like how you mentioned a little bit about that this some of the the those passion pro, pro, um, projects and the squeaky wheels and. and I've seen this a lot with um, with a lot of zoos, a lot of aquariums, a lot of museums where they spend so much time, effort, and energy on those very awesome programs that just don't bring a lot of people. You know, like yeah, the sleepovers, yeah. the overnights, or like you said, maybe even education. Um, bringing it's it, it is true to the mission, but unfortunately, if the doors are shut, sometimes you can't have the the mission. Um, and I well, think, I mean, are you going to have an organization at the end of the day? I mean, let's face it, if you're looking at, you know, you're at the end of March and you're th you have enough cash to last two months and you burn through that cash in June or July, you're looking at not having an organization. I mean, looking at the media, the number of museums that are starting to go out um, in organizations that are not going to make it are, are failing at a tremendous amount. And it's just going to start sliding further down the road. And so you come to a point where the decision is, what is my obligation to make sure this organization exists in a year? Versus what is the nice thing or the fun thing or the friend, the thing I like to do is, and and you may be able to adjust it. You just mentioned overnights. I mean, we're we're already working at, with LA County to take our overnights from inside into tents on a on the decks of the ship, right? You could adjust something like that and be able to address that program and still engagement, and still generate some revenue off of it. You just change the basic measures of it. Yeah, uh, interesting. I, Matthew, I, I, I pulled up some of the poll results here. Yeah, so we had asked kind of some of the other decisions that, that folks had been needing to make during this time. And, and you know, certainly uh, Nick, Claudette, and Jonathan, you know, open to any of the thoughts or, or ideas that you've had on some of these. But, um, you know, we talked earlier about kind of whether or not as an organization we're going to enforce wearing masks. And I think that's that's been, you know, a, a decision everybody's been making uh, of late, every single business. Um, you know, also someone who was uh, looking casually at, at virtual pl uh, platforms and touchless before the pandemic, but then really kind of, you know, maybe uh, looking at that now much more aggressively given um, the, the uh, implications of that in a, uh, a pandemic. Um, you know, new activities and, and events. Um, so, uh, you know, having, you know, introducing some, some new opportunities that we haven't had any before. Are there, um, you know, uh, Nick? Maybe I'll, I'll start with you. I mean, are any thoughts on on on, uh, on some of these uh, decisions and and how you might have uh, uh, gone after and addressed some of them? So we we tend to again simplify you know simplify the um, simplify the question and simplify the conversation. And so we we tend to look at the problems as being. And, and if only Donald Rumsfeld had not known, had not used his known unknown quote and used something simpler, I think everybody would have understood him. So we look at, you know, there are easy problems, which, you know, you know the question, you know the answer. It's just how do you how do you do it? There are difficult problems, which are, you know, the question, you know, you think to solve, but you, you don't know the answer. And then there are wicked problems, which is you don't even know the question, let alone figuring out what the answer is. And I think you know certainly what Jonathan was talking about right now a lot of a lot of pro things that we're facing are wicked you know we don't know we don't know when we're opening you know how do you you know how, how do you figure out what the answer is if you don't know and so you know sometimes it's like well we'll, we'll make a best effort we'll make some assumptions and and we'll proceed in that way so in, in those situations, do you do you game it out? Do you end up making kind of multiple plans? I mean, do you, do you would you look at it in that way as well? Yeah. So you do. You, you know the, that kind of futurist predictive method of saying, okay, here's all the things that could happen from you know most you know uh, most optimistic to you know most pessimistic, and and you you know if you can figure out what those what those boundaries are. 
you know, the likelihood is that something in the middle is going to be where you're at. And so, you know, what's what's the best scenario? What's the worst scenario? You're probably going to be somewhere in the middle. But I think, you know, the whole um, uh, expect the worst plan for the best or whatever that one is. I'm mixing my metaphors. Um, you know, you, you, you just that's why it's wicked, you know, because you don't know what's happening. And you're at, you know, I think the frustration is that you're kind of out of control of it. You know, you're not in a position to control what's going on. So, you know, Balboa Park, every, you know, we're city property. And so we're at the whim of the city in terms of whether we can open or not. And even when we can open, if we are at 25% attendance, then it, it makes no sense to open. You know, we've already had institutions say we're not opening uh, un until the threshold is 50% because it just doesn't make any sense, any economic sense or financial sense. For us to open, and so you know they're kind of doubling down on um, digital engagement. You know, figuring out how to generate revenue from digital to compensate for some of that. Um, you know, it's cheaper for them to. You know, unfortunately, they have no living collection, so they can um, they can shut their building. But a lot cheaper for them to stay closed right now and just you know focus on what they can. Great, and uh, Claudette, I I um, would assume that that there's you know y'all have made plan, you know, multiple plans, like m multiple variations. Is, is there ever a point where you've kind of said, hey, I'm going to like, you know, we, we don't need this many variations or, or how did you kind of um, box in uh, thinking through the, some of those plans? Boy, box it. I wish I could box it in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that that's just, um, I mean, it's constant scenario planning. There's, you know, the what ifs are endless. And, um, you know, it's also been incredibly insightful, I have to say. It, you know, I've been at Knott's Berry Farm for seven years now, just over seven. And obviously, in no time since I've been here has the park ever had an extended period of closure. So it's really given us an opportunity to understand, you know, what is our minimum level of burn rate? We've never had to look at that before. And, you know, it's like I said, it's just, um, that's, it's what I do like all the time now when I'm not just doing my job. It's it's just scenario planning. And, um, you know, fortunately, I enjoy it because <laughs> otherwise it would be a nightmare. But I just I don't think that, you know, you can't stop on those what ifs and looking at uh, the choices that you have to make and the financial impact of those and not just the financial impact. I mean, this is where finance doesn't work in a vacuum. This is where we work with the other groups and talk about, you know, there's the financial impact, there's the guest impact, there's, I can't stress enough that I, you know, with, with what Jonathan has been saying, preserving the business has got to be our number one priority. It's it's one thing to make the guests feel good, to make our associates feel good, but if we don't have a business to come back to, then it's all for naught. Ooh, pun there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really great point. I, I think um, it, w one of the things I, I heard in a little bit of that as well is is finding folks that really enjoy thinking through all the what ifs, right? And and maybe that's not somebody that it was traditional like that you would have normally gone through, but has emerged in that. And making sure that you're giving them um, some opportunity to to really shine and and help through that. Yeah, isn't that, for sure. Isn't that, isn't that the ultimate uh, <laughs> career advice? You know, find out what you love doing and then get somebody to pay you for it. Absolutely. <laughs> well, one of the, that's one of the great things about being in this industry uh, at all. I mean, I always tell everybody the best job I ever had was the one I started at first, you know, working in a water park. And I somehow managed to stay in the attractions industry. And I think that's that's something that we that's near and dear to all of our hearts is is we want to be involved and we want to stay stay in this industry and we want to help each other. And that's why we do these webinars is because we ultimately want people to learn from each other um, something something great that that Knotts did or something amazing that the, the Iowa did or you know some of the exercises that you mentioned. Um, we didn't get a chance to look at all the slides, Nick, but I, I really do want to say, I, I, I want to end on this slide before we kind of give a quick shout out to our team. But I, I love this concept of everything that you're doing right now, everything that you're going through, you got to take advantage of the of, of of the opportunity that's been given to you. Sometimes it's forced, right? So right now, yeah, we've had to make tough decisions, but isn't it ultimately, this is a great time to have our team members trained in other areas. That's good for them. 
it's good for them to better understand the business and it, it's good for you for efficiencies. And so as you're looking through these process, everything needs to be intentional. Um, I used to, this is an intentional design pyramid where you want to push everybody up. You want to consistently be pushing the people up to give them the most opportunity, but also your processes need to be advanced. You know, how you do measurement. I love this is like going from this no measurement to understanding that I'm constantly measuring. I, I, I'm constantly looking at the data. I'm looking at technology that's scalable, it's sustainable. It, and I think COVID is really forcing this upon us. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we ended with a quote about, are, are we spending too much time looking backwards to try to look at the world that we had? And really the gift that's in front of us is this new tomorrow. And um, I think that you guys have done a great job of helping us move forward in that space. So I appreciate all of you guys very much for, for joining today. Um, if it's okay with everybody, um, I'm gonna share your emails and information in an email. So Jonathan and Claudette and Nick, if um, you guys might get some 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 quick chats and hellos and some how do you do's on LinkedIn. Um, everybody that's listening um, and, and joining us today, if this is your first webinar, thank you for joining us. Um, we'd love to have you come to more. We'd love to have you participate as a panelist. If you are interested, please uh, let us know. We'd love to let you share some great ideas like the team did today. Just drop us a line. Um, if you're in our zoo and aquarium community, I'm pretty excited to share some information. We're getting ready to ramp up for AZA, which is you know, the week of September 14th, we're actually gonna be doing a special, a special webinar just for zoos and aquarium. We've lined up some great leaders in the industry to join us, um, but we also have this cool webinar just about using our tools. So if you're using our tools at Gateway and you wanna maybe see how they can be optimized for zoos and aquariums, you're welcome to join us. If you're just wanting to see what's out there and wanting to benchmark, that's cool. Um, if you wanna join us next, um, uh, Thursday, we're going to be having this kind of demonstration of some of our functionality. And then the following week, two weeks from today, we'd love to have you on our next webinar, which will be awesome um, as well. So you can click on that link or, or scan that QR code and join us. So on behalf of Gateway Ticketing and my friend Matthew, Bill and Greg and the team behind the scenes, and a huge thank you to Nick, Jonathan and Claudette. Thank you guys for joining us today. We wish you a happy Wednesday and we'll see you real soon. <laughs> Cheers. Take yeah. care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. <laughs>